Good morning. My name is Katie Corella and I am Arts Fund's Programs and Advocacy Coordinator. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Activate Your Board in Advocacy, How to Bring Your Board Along. This webinar is a part of Arts Fund's annual convenings programming sponsored by the Boeing Company. Our convening series provides the cultural sector a platform for sharing of resources, best practices, and perspectives to expand our collective capacity to serve our community. We partner with local, regional, and national practitioners and thought leaders like Rena and Bold Agenda to foster discussion and provide tools and training opportunities in direct response to the needs identified by regional arts and cultural organizations like all of you. Whether this is your first time joining us or if you're a returning attendee, thank you for being a part of our convenings. I'd like to give a brief introduction, introduction to Rena before we get started. Rena Henderson Mason leads Bold Agenda, a consulting, training, and coaching firm focused on empowering board and staff leaders to embrace change, push bold ideas, and build great teams through a range of cycles. She helps facilitate the critical discussions, processes, and decisions that advance an organization with the focus on better governance, courageous leadership, strategic planning, and a more inclusive and equitable approach. Raina learned much of what she knows about arts leadership in her seven years as a volunteer board development consultant for the Arts and Business Council of Chicago. Prior to launching Bold Agenda, Raina spent over 20 years helping scale businesses in the food, real estate, publishing, and investment banking industries. Raina has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a bachelor's in finance from Georgetown University. She is a board sourced certified governance trainer an ICF certified coach and experienced facilitator. She serves on the board of Arts Alliance Illinois and as a regional leader for the National Association of Women Business Owners Chicago chapter. In her community, she is the president of the Lake Meadows Park Advisory Council. We are delighted to have Rena and her expertise for this session. And with that, I'll hand it over to her. Um, so I, I tend to work with organizations that are you know, thinking about change, um, but there's no better way to affect change than with advocacy. And so um, we'll talk about that today. So this webinar is really not about uh, helping you develop a tactical plan to deal with particular legislation or how to deal with the Trump administration. This webinar is about understanding what it takes to build and engage your board to advocate for your mission under any circumstances. Um, and, and I will qualify this. Uh, normally, this is a three to six hour workshop. <laughs> Uh, that I've condensed down into a one hour webinar. So clearly we can't solve your advocacy issues, uh, but what, what is here is a framework uh, for you to consider uh, how you think about getting your board involved in advocacy. So there'll still be a lot of questions um, after this webinar. There'll still be lots of how do I do this, uh, more of the, the tactics of getting things done. I, I will, I've provided some resources to links to toolkits at the end so that you can dig deeper and further. And hopefully you will have at least uh, a framework on how to get started with this. So, First, we'll talk about why get the board involved. I'm sure some of you know, but um, I, we really want to break it down and, and really making the case to your board why they should be involved. Uh, we'll talk about the key elements of a successful board advocacy plan, and then really getting your board ready to do this because it's not, you, you don't throw them in there uh, and expect them to be great uh, advocates, but you have to give them trainings and training and tools. And then we'll talk a little bit about what um, a board action plan might look like, the things that you might want to incorporate. So 
if you have questions, I would encourage you um, to start to put them in the chat box now. We'll stop maybe about 40 minutes in, maybe 35, 40 minutes in, take some questions, and then we'll keep moving, and then we'll have 10 minutes in at the end for any other questions. But uh, if you have some questions now, I would encourage you to start putting them in so we can tee them up. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is an audience poll. Uh, I just wanna know who's on the line, sort of. If you could respond to the poll, that would be great. So whether you're a nonprofit CEO, a board chair, soon to be board chair, senior staff, board officer, I know some of you may have multiple roles. I would say what's your primary role that you're representing in terms of advocacy? All right, the poll is closed and these are the results. Okay. So it looks like the majority of you are, uh, oh, actually, uh, it looks like board officer. Oh, that's great. That's usually not the case on these. And so, and then the nonprofit CEO. So that's great. I, I'm glad to hear. It's a good balance of, of board and staff. So, okay, we'll, we'll keep going then. So, um, this is another audience poll. Sort of give me a sense of your board, sort of where you stand. You already have some strong advocates, but want to improve. You tried advocacy, but you're struggling. Um, had a few strong advocates, but no longer. You're just starting with advocacy, or you have no idea what you're doing. So take a few, few minutes. Uh, few seconds, actually, not minutes, to respond. All right, I'm going to go ahead and um, launch the results. Okay. Wow, okay. Well, good. There's some strong advocates out there. That's great. Um, so. Um, some of you are just getting started, and then there's others who have a few strong advocates, but no longer. So um, then some of you are struggling. Okay, so we'll, we'll get the framework right so that you can um, be really strong at this. Um, so really, let's talk a little bit about what is advocacy. I have a few definitions here. Um, I, I guess the first one is, is the one I like the best because it's the simplest. It's really making the case for your cause or mission, um, no matter what you do. It's uh, particularly in the context of a, a, a nonprofit. It's like you are making the case. So um, the other one is uh, Rod Joy. He used to be the, the the executive director of Arts Alliance Illinois, but he went on to run for uh, elected office in Illinois. And and his advocacy is dem democracy in action. And I think we have seen the populace sort of activated in terms of getting more aware of how to get their voice out there and, and be be democratic and, and engage in, in our, our democracy. And I think that's important. There's a longer definition uh, from the Boulder Advocacy website. I won't read it, but, but there's a lot of ways to view it. Um, I think most people, when the first thing they think of is, uh, of advocacy is lobbying. And lobbying is, one element of advocacy. Uh, some organizations hire lobbyists to advance issues or legislation, but there's many other ways to to be an advocate. You know, a lot of it is education and research, um, really making the case, no matter 
who it is with key stakeholders. Uh, it doesn't have to be legislation. It could just be in your own community. It could be with partners. It could be with key stakeholders. Another one that we're seeing a lot of is voter enga engagement, whether it's a get out the vote in a nonpartisan way, town halls, uh, candidate forums. Actually, here in Chicago, I'm in Chicago and in Illinois, we've had some big races. Right now, we're in the middle of a mayoral uh, runoff. And so the Arts Alliance Illinois had, uh, prior to the, uh, the, the, uh, the runoff, we had when we had 14 um, mayoral candidates, we had a mayoral forum. Uh, and clearly with the arts at the uh, hosting it, we, the topic was arts and arts as a part of our uh, city, our communities. And so um, now in the mayoral uh, runoff, the two leading candidates who sat on that mayoral forum you know, we have their statement and their, their worldview and their perspective on, on the arts. Uh, and we've put it out there on, if you go to our website, you can see that. Um, you know, they, uh, not dissimilar views. I think that they both view the arts as, as important for the city's cultural vibrancy. But it's great because I think it's gotten people engaged in a way about our issues, our mission. Um, and then there's organizing, whether it's uh, boots on the street or it's emails to affect change. Um, there's a lot of organizing that can happen uh, online. It can happen um, door by door in the community to affect change uh, or to raise the, your, your mission. And then there's litigation. I haven't seen that too much in the art sector litigation, but there are a lot of social justice organizations who use litigation as one of their key tactics. You know, I think of the ACLU, the NAACP, Lambda Legal, those, those organizations, you know, have a key component of their advocacy for key issues and their mission is using lit litigation. And it can be used effectively. Um, so what I want you to think about, um, our next one, we're doing another audience poll. Tell us about your advocacy activities and check all that apply. So you can check more than one because I recognize that organizations do more than one. All right, we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like education and research. And, and that's, that's quite typical of um, arts organizations, but there's a fair number of organizing and lobbying. Um, I, I also want to be clear about this is that there is some confusion with uh, many organizations about whether they can lobby or not. You can lobby, but it, there is a limit based on your budget size and, and the number of expenditures as a 501c3. If you really want to go sort of full force on lobbying, there's another structure, usually a 501c4, where you can do unlimited lobbying. But there's, you know, if you are engaging in lobbying, I would, I would encourage you to make sure that you understand the law so you don't uh, affect your 501c3 status. So but that's good that, that, that everybody's doing a little bit of, of everything. And so no one so far has done any litigation, but I, I really haven't seen that with arts organizations. Um, it would, I think it would have to get to be a big, big issue. But there's lots of issues now around the arts uh, to be advocates for, whether it's local, state, certainly federal, 
uh, with the current federal budget, uh, elimination of the NEA and a lot of arts funding. So um, this is a great time to start talking about it. So why get the board involved? That's what we're going to talk about because sometimes the board's not clear why they should be involved. Um, so the first thing is um, it's really about strengthening your organization. When you get your board involved in advocacy, it's about one way of engaging your board in a way that's different than anything else. You know, it also develops the same skills needed for effective fundraising. You know, 90% of effective fundraising is sort of doing research, cultivating, educating, and, and stewarding relationships. It's the same thing with advocacy. Um, and then really you can begin to position your organization as a leader on advocacy issues. Um, you, you begin to be known as someone who has a voice. Uh, and then it can raise your profile for your organization among key stakeholders um, and opens the doors to powerful people and groups many times. You can also advance your field or sector, uh, you know, the broader arts field. But when you start to get down to that, that aspect of art that you are focused on, whether it's museums or dance or arts education um, or music, um, you can begin to focus on the issues that raise all, all the boats in the water. Um, so you begin to open doors, I think, to deeper collaborations and partnerships. And you begin to raise the profile of the sector and its impact on individuals, communities, and the overall economy. I think this is where particularly the arts. The arts has, I think, a unique sort of position to many opportunities for intersectionality among other sectors, even in the for-profit sector, or aligned with social justice organizations, education, anti-violence, housing. There's a way in to broaden the base of support um, if you are doing advocacy. And I think the final reason um, for getting the board involved is transforming themselves. There's something that happens when you are able to advocate for the mission. You learn how to make change in your community. You learn more about your mission as, as a board member. You can gain the confidence about educating others and acting on your behalf. And I think you really begin to develop the leadership skills necessary to be a great board member and a great fundraiser. So there's a lot of good reasons why getting the board involved in advocacy makes a lot of sense. Um, so we'll, we'll start to break this down into really three areas, engagement, relationships, and communication. So engagement. So it, it's got to be fundamental to the mission and board service, your advocacy. Um, it, we talked about it encourages leadership, and then you develop the skills used in fundraising. Relationships. I think this is really um, one thing that we underestimate um, is that board members many times have access to, to doors and networks that staff doesn't have. You can open a door to a policymaker that maybe a staff person has. The, the other thing that I see with arts and culture organizations, many times um, the board may have uh, broader political connections or community connections um, that the staff is, is not likely to develop, either because of their beliefs or their, their 
political persuasion. Um, and so you be can, through your board, begin to build bridges across the aisle. Um, we've certainly seen that here in Illinois. Um, and then you can connect with, with stakeholders. It's, you know, important to have, you know, key stakeholders who may know not so much about your organization, but they can get into your advocacy issues. Um, so the, the third area in communication, um, one of the things about getting the board involved is it expands the range of voices raising the issue. So if you're only hearing from staff about issues and um, it's helpful because board members may have may go into to uh, geographies and 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 board other boardrooms where the issue is not being talked about. Um, you you have a broader distribution of of hopefully a nonpartisan message, and and you raise um, the issues uh, and the priorities of your organization. So, so I want you to think about, given what we've seen, where your, uh, your board needs to spend the most time on, whether it's on engagement, relationships, or communication. It'll take a few seconds. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the poll and share those results. Okay, um, relationships. Okay, and usually that is that is quite typical, um, but also communication coming in sort of a distant second and engagement. So the board's engaged; they know how to communicate. It's about building relationships. Okay, great. So. What does it take for successful uh, board advocacy? Uh, we'll talk about this and then we'll roll into questions. So successful advocacy actually happens when we have a leadership commitment and that usually comes from the board chair and the CEO. Um, those two key fig figures our key leaders are really important in advancing any kind of advocacy initiative. We want the full board support, but if the board chair and the CEO are not, not aligned and behind it, it's not going to happen. Um, the mission, vision, and value integration. Um, if it's not explicitly or even implicitly a part of your mission, vision, and values, then it will never get the energy from your board. So you've got to begin to build this into your culture, what you talk about. And it's it's got to be a culture that supports advocacy um, and and recognizing that advocacy has risk. And so um, and so you're building a culture that can support a certain amount of risk. And you need to talk about some of those risks uh, when you start to advocate for your mission. Um, it's an opportunity to rally supporters beyond your own organization, whether they be key influencers, community leaders, legislature, legislators, the media. Um, it's it can align the message way beyond your doors. It's important to put money behind it um, and recognize there are funders who will support advocacy. Uh, you have to do your research. 
um, and fine, um, but you should have a budget and a fundraising plan to support key advocacy issues. Um, and, and maybe this is where it's important to think broadly and, and build coalitions because that's more likely to get funded than say a standalone organization uh, fighting a singular uh, fight. Uh, and so capacity expansion. Um, there's got to be a commitment to investing in the capacity at the board and staff levels to do advocacy, whether it's with resources, with structures, uh, skills and processes, maybe you have a task force on it, uh, certainly training, that's all really important. So that is what it takes to do successful advocacy. So I'll take some questions now. And um, if you have any, Katie, you can. Um, they are uh, rolling in. I do have um, a question now that I can go ahead and pose to you, Rena. OK. Um, what, what means can we use to convey our message and not just preach to the choir, so to speak? Yeah. and um, and. So it's funny, that's, that's my big bugaboo about uh, sort of a lot of the, the things we do at the Arts Alliance is preaching to the choir. I, I do think that intersectionality, uh, whether it's uh, cross-sector, cross-community, um, expanding sort of the base of support for a particular issue, um, when you start to think of who has a vested interest in this, um, I think it's important. Um, we are, the Arts Alliance Illinois is a statewide organization, so it's um, many of the issues that we fight for are go statewide. I mean, I gave you an example of just the city of Chicago, but the, the biggest issue that we have advocated for at the state, which is really gonna put the state on the map, is arts education standards through uh, the State Board of Education. And that was, that was a huge lift, but it wasn't just arts organizations at the table. We brought, you know, just educators, principals, teachers, um, school districts along um, to get them aligned with establishing some standards across um, arts education. And so that there was this collective voice and that parents, you know, many times can be advocates and parents can come in, in many shades and, and, and stripes. Uh, so um, I think it's about thinking broadly um, about who your issue affects. Um, and that is, that's always a challenge is, you know, many times we are literally preaching to the choir, <laughs> literally and figuratively. So another question? Yeah. Our organization has embarked on a DEI mission, but is stymied regarding changing the culture to one of inclusion. Can you share resources that would promote successful inclusion of those people who have historically been marginalized and who we are now trying to recruit? Yeah, you know, um, last year I did a webinar on diversity and inclusion. I, I don't know, Katie, is it still on the website? I think it's still on the website that we recorded it because I do think that that is a big standalone issue that goes beyond advocacy. And yes, there are inclusive there are a diversity and inclusion issues that your board can advocate for internally and uh, certainly externally. Uh, but I think that there's got to be a separate initiative just around diversity, inclusion, and equity 
um, that uh, stands on its own. You know, and one of the key things that I say about diversity, inclusion, and equity, it is a change management initiative. And so it's got to go deep and wide in your organization. It's got to be owned by the leadership. It's got to be embedded in your strategy. It's got to be incorporated in your values and your mission, explicitly or implicitly. It's got to come with money, big money, um, and recognize that it is a long-term effort. And it requires, requires a big lift and investment. So I would encourage you to take a look at that webinar. And uh, maybe Katie, I don't know, you want to send out a link afterwards to the participants if they don't, um, if they haven't heard it um, already. Yes, I'll be um, happy to send out a link to the series that Rena hosted um, last year on um, strengthening the board. Um, there is uh, three webinars available on our website, and I can share that resource with you all. Okay, great. Um, any more questions, but we'll we'll keep moving. Yeah, let's keep moving. Um, I think we have um, we'll we'll have a few more at the end. Um, I have a couple that I can ask now, or we can continue on. Okay, how do we get this started? Well, I think for anyone who's just getting it started, it's about developing a shared vision with your board. Board, you know, this is a this can be a full uh, part of a board retreat. It could be a key piece on the board agenda, agenda, but developing a shared vision about what advocacy looks like for your organization. And that's really, you know, because some people may not be on board with the lobbying piece. I mean, I think that does require, you know, a certain amount of commitment behind it. Um, and then un have, an understanding of how your advocacy is tied to your mission that will advance your programs, your, your positioning, the artwork that you do. Um, maybe identify some opportunities and threats out there. What happens if we do this? What happens if we don't? Uh, where is the opportunity in advancing our organization, strengthening our organization, or potentially putting our organization at risk? Those are some of the conversations you need to have. Oops, I'm sorry, I went backwards. Um, and then think about how you activate the board to make it happen. Is it a task force? Is it a committee? Is it recruiting, you know, beginning to fill the gaps on the board because there aren't the kinds of people on the board who have the networks that would help with any kind of advocacy effort. And then start to integrate it into the culture, whether it's a conversation every, every board meeting, whether there's key learnings that you need to have, the Arts Alliance Illinois, we are an advocacy organization. So it's in every meeting that we have in some way. We, we talk about our av advocacy work. We talk about the things that we're doing in terms of organizing. Uh, we spend a lot of time convening people to get the right people in the room. So it is embedded in our culture. People expect us to do that whenever we have any kind of communication to the board or to, the, the, uh, to our audience, to our members. Uh, so it is, it is who we are. It is, it is in our mission. Um, but it may not be in yours. So you have to think about be very conscious about how you integrate it into the culture. So when you start the boardroom conversation, I want you to think about what kind of change you're trying to make and the impact. You know, how big is it? Is it very targeted 
geographically? You know, is it a local community? Uh, you know, just your, your immediate community, your neighborhood or maybe a broader geographic area? Is it local? Is it regional? You know, whether it's your county or a lot larger area uh, uh, where you're located? Or do you go much broader? You know, whether it's statewide, it's a national issue, or maybe even it's an international issue. Um, thinking about sort of what, how far you want to make a change. It also will suggest to you the kinds of resources you will need and who you may need to align with uh, and partner with. So, and when you think about the impact on change, think about the time frame. Is this a current fiscal year issue? Um, so for us in Illinois, a lot of these issues around arts education are the current fiscal year. There's something in front of the State Board of Education about arts education indicators. Uh, schools will, we're trying to push indicators where schools will be measured uh, based on some key indicators on whether they are serving the students well in terms of arts and culture in their school, arts education in school. And so this is a, uh, an immediate thing. Think about maybe there's, you recognize there's a much broader issue that you're trying to deal with in terms of advocacy and it's more something that you need to invest in. Maybe it's a strategic plan cycle. Or maybe it's something much bigger and broader or because you're going to a larger geographic area, it is a longer term issue uh, that goes beyond a strategic plan. So these are the things you should be talking about. You know, what is the scale that you're trying to impact change? Is it just your organization? Is it you and many of your partners, other key stakeholders, or is it the broader sector, um, wherever you are? And so this will determine how you focus your effort. So getting your board ready. Um, so that is always a challenge. Um, so this, these are some of the barriers that may be present for the board um, that when they don't engage in advocacy or they don't embrace it in some way, it's, it's difficult to do it when there's a leadership transition, whether it's a staff leader, the CEO or ED is in transition, or the board chair or the executive slate. That's not a good time to, to begin a new initiative. I think people need to get settled in and embrace sort of any kind of advocacy initiative. That poor understanding of the issues and the mission impact. So making that case up front of why the board should get involved is really important. Hopefully, whatever issue it is that you're advocating for, you've done some research in, on, you have some learnings uh, that you can share with the board, and really educating them on, on them and how it impacts your mission. I think frequently organizations will spend a lot of time focusing on tactics. Um, and that may be fine for your staff. It's probably too in the weeds for your board. They need to understand the overall strategy. Why, you know, you know, giving them that understanding, but this, this strategy of going and, and putting this particular advocacy issue forward is going to impact us how and why and what, you know, what are the outcomes? Why is this good for our organization three, five, 10 years down the line? 
And then I mentioned this before, this confusion about lobbying. People get really uncomfortable with it. I, I hear this over and over, well, we shouldn't be lobbying. You can lobby, you just have to be very conscious about when you're lobbying, track the time, track the expenditures, and not spend over a certain amount. Um, so lack of you know, support, in, and the resources to do the work. So, you know, it's hard to do advocacy without spending money. Um, I, I know that uh, most organizations are, are stretched thin, but it's, it's really important to have uh, those resources behind. The limited time that your board has, whether it's at board meetings or between meetings, to advocate, so I think part of it is making it easy for them, whether it's easy toolkits, making introductions, uh, you know, there, there will be some board members who have more time than others. You should have a range of ways that, that every board member can be involved, whether it takes five minutes to do an email to their legislature or to arrange for a meeting with a key community leader and sitting down with them for lunch. You know, the, the, there should be the whole gamut of opportunities for people to engage in advocacy, recognizing that there's limited time. So now let's talk about getting your board ready. Recruiting. So I always talk about recruiting. If you can get recruiting right, 80% of your board problems will be solved. So when you're thinking about advocacy, it's also thinking about who's on your board that can advocate for your mission, and thinking about their networks. But not only having that conversation about their networks, but making sure that they're willing to engage their networks, open up doors for your to for you to advocate. Um, because it, it really doesn't do any good if someone has great contacts, but they're not willing to reach out to them. So really think about the gaps that you may have on your board. Understanding, getting your board to understand and clarify their role in advocacy. Um, it's much like clarifying their role in fundraising. The two are so similar that if you can get your board to understand their role in advocacy, they will certainly understand their role in fundraising and vice versa. And so it, these are almost interchangeable skills and roles. Um, and then training, you know, there's lots of training out there. There's, you know, you might have it locally in an in-person. There's plenty of webinars. At the end of this webinar, there's some resources. You can use those resources. Um, your, any kind of state advocacy organization, your state nonprofit or uh, association usually is doing advocacy and is usually doing advocacy training. Um, I would encourage you to, to think about that. Um, but your board needs to understand sort of messaging and how to reach out to people uh, and what advocacy is. And then thinking about, um, I put this on here as succession planning because you know, when your key advocates leave your board, is your advocacy initiative like dead? Um, I think the entire board needs to be trained, but there should be some leaders being groomed, that next generation of leaders groomed to step into the shoes of those who are out there in front. So you as an organization are helping groom your board members, you know, at every single level, not only the leaders, but, you know, the board members who sometimes may be a little bit quiet or stepping back to be good advocates in any way they feel comfortable. 
So, and it's talking about this. It's like who, if we lose, if our board chair, uh, their term is up, and they they were that person was our greatest advocate. Who's going to step into that role? Those should be some very conscious discussions, much like they are in putting forth uh, a slate of officers every few years. Um, so, and of course, support underneath. That support from, from the staff, support from uh, the budget. Uh, you've got to support all these efforts. So, Let's talk about action planning, what it takes to do an action plan. The first step is assessing and engaging your board. And what does, what does it mean to assess your board? Uh, really, it's looking at their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It could be a informal conversation about that. It can be a more formal assessment. You may incorporate it in a board self-assessment if you haven't done one. Um, or you could have just a very focused conversation about, is our board ready to do advocacy? What are we missing? Um, so, and engaging your board, you know, that linking the advocacy to mission, you know, educating them about the impact and how they can impact the advocacy effort. And then this is always the tension, advocating for the mission versus their personal beliefs. I tend to see this more in social service organizations where the board is way more conservative than the staff and maybe even more conservative than the communities that they serve. And so why would they advocate for more sta state spending on social services when they fundamentally politically believe in a lean government or less spending? And so I think that's one of the challenges many times in activating the board and engaging them and understanding they're supporting the mission, not a particular uh, political or ideological belief. Um, and so these are conversations actually you should begin to have when you're recruiting, um, that, that the people that you're recruiting can get behind your uh, mission 100%. So thinking about sort of how you lead and strategize, you know, making advocacy, you know, part of being part of the board leadership, the accountability, the recruiting, people modeling good behavior, uh, you know, building the network. Um, you need to define your strategy and your goals. Uh, for advocacy at the organization level, at the board level, and at the individual um, board member level. So in an in individual understands sort of what should I be doing? Uh, should I be sending out emails, maybe a call to action? Should I be reaching out to particular community uh, uh, partners? Should I be reaching out to my own legislator, who may be different than the organizations uh, where the organization resides legislator, so that there's a much broader base of support. Being very clear about the strategy and the goals at every level is important. Um, and so also beginning to identify how you may be collaborative collaborating and sharing with other organizations, you know, and beginning to identify common interests, developing relationships, building coalitions, associations um, that may be very focused on those key issues. And then, so when you're 
moving to execute and refine, you're providing board members with tools, the training, the communication tools, give them some role-playing exercises in person, um, or also tools, digital tools that they can just use, whether it's in their social media or email. And then this ongoing support when you have an advocacy campaign. Um, and then start to, to think about how you're going to measure um, you know, the impact, whether you have some key successes, some stories to share. Storytelling is really important in this. And so being able to share some stories around, for example, arts education and how it is there's a lot of data that's collected, at least here in Chicago and Illinois, about the impact of the arts on educational outcomes. And that data is really important to policymakers. Uh, you can tell all the stories you want, but there's got to be the data there, too. Um, you know, identify some of the challenges, you know, maybe you need to make adjustments midstream in, in what you're doing. Um, and always constantly reassess and re-engage. Um, it, it is, uh, I think, for many, uh, particularly arts organizations, they're sort of new to the game of advocacy. And so there may have to be adjustments. You know, it may not be built into your DNA like some other like social service organizations or how housing organizations usually are pretty good at advocacy. Um, and so it also might, and that may be why you may want to partner with them. Watch what those other organizations who are really experienced in doing advocacy in all of those typical activities, watch what they're doing. Um, I actually many times point out what the housing organizations are doing to engage their constituencies because so much of housing is particularly affordable housing is funded by government and so they have had to be and so many layers of subsidy to make affordable housing happen watch what they do pick the housing organizations in your community and really look at what they do because i think they're usually a great great model the ACLU is just, you know, talk about advocacy. Um, they're out there front. They, I mean, they probably have much bigger budgets than <laughs> any of the arts organizations that we're talking about. But there are some things that they do well that don't require huge dollars. Homework. Um, so what issues can the board influence most? I mean, think about that. I mean, there, there might be some advocacy issues that may need to stay at the staff level because um, maybe it's very tactical, but really think about the issues that the board can influence um, and, and that they may have a, a reach that goes beyond what the staff can do. And really thinking about the issues that will have an impact in the short term and, and the long term, three, five years from now. We really go down them. Because I think what the board needs to be involved in is a discussion about, with limited resources, where should we spend our time that would best advance the mission? Where can we have the greatest impact? Start that boardroom conversation. Tee it up, maybe at your next board meeting, maybe at your next board retreat, uh, to talk about sort of how advocacy uh, should happen at the board level. You know, you, you will get a sense of whether there is broad support for it and you should invest and move forward, or whether there's a lot of caution and people want to know more and maybe you need to go back and do some research and more formulation before you launch any kind of advocacy initiative. Um, and so that's really important. Um, and then begin to develop an action plan for board advocacy. If you're already doing advocacy, 
maybe you need to to be more grounded in it. Put some put some pen to paper or or really fingers to to keyboard and and really lay out a plan, not just for this year, but maybe a three year plan. Align it with your strategic plan. It should flow with what you're doing strategically. It should be aligned with whatever you are doing um, programmatically, artistically, and, and embedded in your mission. Um, so uh, this is really about successful advocacy in any environment, uh, whether the, the waves of change are moving towards you or away from you, uh, whether you're focused on uh, a very uh, parochial or community issues or much larger federal issues, um, getting your board ready. I mean, it, this is not something to launch into lightly and develop a really formal, you know, if the board is, is, is behind it and wants to be engaged in it, develop a, a, an action plan for them to approve for them to, to embrace and for them to lead. Um, so here's some resources. Um, Board Source did this campaign a few years ago around Stand For Your Mission. It's a standalone website that has lots of information, tools. Uh, the National Council of Nonprofits has information. Boulder Advocacy is just an advocacy organization that does training on advocacy. And so they have a lot of material and, and tools. So you'll so your so your so your state profits has tools, Americans for the Arts. I pulled up the National Art Education Association, but you can get very uh, specific, sort of uh, lots of core, you know, I'm trying to think of all the organization. Uh, there's a muse, alliance of museums, the uh, National Organization for or Orchestras, I forgot what it's called. Uh, there's dance, uh, a national organization, there's several of them. Um, there's lots of national organizations that are doing, and in, in specific art sectors that are doing uh, advocacy. It's important to understand who they are and how you get involved. Um, you know, there's always there back uh, earlier this month, there was the National Arts Advocacy Day, where hopefully someone from your state, a group of arts leaders went to Washington to meet with key legislatures in that in the House and the Senate from from your state. Um, the Arts Alliance Illinois always brings a, a good pool of people. Um, we, this year we had students, um, high school students, we had college students, we had arts leaders, we had board members, uh, we had arts funders, all going to Washington with a common message about the arts needs to be funded at the federal level, but also it, it lets you get to know your, your own state um, Legislatures developing relationships and them hearing why arts is, are, are important in your own state. This is great. I hope you are able to make the case to your board for stronger advocacy and investing it in it for the long run. Um, it is really about uh, supporting your mission. And here's my contact information, um, and thank you. All right, we are going to have to wrap up there. Thank you for joining us at Arts Fund for our webinar, Activate Your Board in Advocacy, How to Bring Your Board Along, with Rena Henderson-Mason from Bold Agenda. And thanks so much to Rena for her great presentation. As I said at the top, this program is a part of our annual convening series sponsored by the Boeing Company. I would like to ask that if you have any questions um, or suggestions, please contact me at katiecarella at artsfund.org. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.